Thank you, Bob, yep. and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome all to our, also to our uh, video audience it's being uh, recorded. Um, as Bob said, I'm uh, Brian Meredith from Health Force, and as you may know, uh, our uh, firm was uh, contracted with uh, by uh, the UMass uh, Medical School, PPR, and Department of Mental Health uh, to perform a review here at Mass, uh, Mass Mental of your um, coding and billing. And to a large extent, this uh, educational session that we prepared for you today is um, as an outgrowth or a result of the findings of that review. Um, so uh, we're um, focusing today, we, uh, a few, uh, about a few minutes ago, we had a presentation for the psychiatrist. Uh, we divided the presentation into two uh, sections. This one is focusing on uh, therapy, uh, therapists and the agenda items are there. We're going to be talking about the uh, psychiatric diagnostic interview, the uh, inter interactive complexity services, uh, treatment plans, individual psychotherapy, family therapy, group therapy, and uh, also multi-family group therapy. Uh, these are the primary components of the services offered here um, at Mass Mental. I, I like to keep it informal. Uh, we have we've allowed a little extra time for uh, your questions as we go through and comments, and I, I welcome those. I, it always adds to the presentation, so please feel free to just uh, just shout it out uh, when if you or raise your hand, whatever you prefer, whatever you're more comfortable with. Um, I don't think uh, this slide. I don't think we're going to do too much with this slide, except for the fact that. Um, uh, um, talking about RNs, um, RNs um, as opposed to therapists in the group session. Uh, RNs are allowed to uh, lead groups, conduct groups, and their services are billable uh, under the supervision of a billing provider, uh, under the direct supervision of a billing provider, which means that the billing provider must be present and immediately available if needed. So if, it, if it's co-led, by the RN and a, a billing provider that would certainly meet that requirement. Uh, LMHGs are not recognized by CMS for direct payment, uh, but their services are also billable, again, under uh, direct supervision in the non-facility setting. So, yes? Occupational therapy. <laughs> Occupational therapy is uh, good, or would be billable in the partial hospitalization oh, setting. That's yes. That's yeah. Okay. Okay, so we're going to start with the uh, foundation service for therapy, the diagnostic evaluation. Uh, for this group, we're focusing on 90791, which is the diagnostic evaluation without medication management. That's for the psychiatrist. Uh, but both services include a complete medical, including past medical, family, and uh, social uh, history. For you, the medical history would be as much as you know or as, as what's, what's pertinent. To, to your work, um, wouldn't expect that to be uh, the same as a as a as a uh, an MD, uh, but certainly a, a complete psychiatric history, a mental status examination. Uh, a few years ago, the CMS dropped the word "complete" from the mental status exam requirement, uh, and so now they're leaving it up to the individual therapist to decide what an appropriate. Uh, an appropriately complete mental status exam is. Um, so, it, so for example, the mini mental status exam or the cognitive ex exam, full cognitive testing is not always appropriate, as you know, for all of your patients. So um, why require it as part of the diagnostic interview when it's not appropriate? So this is probably what was behind Medicare, Medicare's uh, change in the language. So you decide what the mental the the, the uh, intensity or the scope of the mental status exam, um, but it shouldn't be so min minimal that an auditor would look at it and say, you know, this isn't, this really isn't an appropriate uh, uh, for a comprehensive uh, diagnostic evaluation. Uh, establishment of initial diagnosis. The diagnosis you may refine the diagnosis as as you treat the patient. That's uh, of course. Uh, but there should be some initial working diagnosis as a result of the diagnostic uh, evaluation. Um, evaluation of the patient's ability and capacity to respond to treatment is needed because Medicare 
some patients are so cognitively impaired, for example, that therapy just isn't considered medically necessary or of value to them. So there has to be some assessment on the initial diagnostic interview. Not that it's not that, not that the evaluation isn't billable, but it has one of the components has to be that evaluation because that evaluation may exclude the patient from further treatment. So if it's not obvious or uh, implied, it's, the Medicare standard is something a requirement either needs to be stated or easily inferred from your documentation. So if it's not easily inferred from your documentation, then it must be stated that the person is, um, is able to respond to treatment. And finally, your initial plan of treatment. Again, it's something that will, will probably be refined as the, as the patient, as treatment progresses, but all of these elements should be present in your uh, initial note. Um, any questions on that? Um, so uh, information can come from someone other than the patient, um, especially the historical piece. Um, the service may be reported once per day, um, and, and, and it may be covered um, uh, usually once at the outset of an illness or a suspected illness, but it may be built again if there's a significant change in the, the patient's status. Um, if the patient has left treatment for a significant amount of time and is now coming back for treatment, they, they, and it's appropriate that they be reevaluated, or if they change providers. Um, and so it's certainly appropriate if you're taking over the care of a patient from some other provider that has left the practice, it's certainly appropriate that you do your own evaluation before you treat the patient. Um, the only thing I want to, the only caution there is that uh, when I was at, years ago when I was at uh, UMass, uh, there was a patient that didn't like anybody. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't like any of their therapists. And they would, they would, you know, they'd, they'd spend a couple of weeks with one therapist and then one to change. And so obviously you wouldn't want to see six or seven uh, diagnostic interviews within a short period of time because the patient was just didn't like their uh, their uh, clinicians. Um, certainly, it was a problem. That I think that they let them change uh, so often, but that but that's another another issue. Um, and uh, children, uh, there may be you may be able to build more than one service if usually the diagnostic interview for children is more than an hour. It may involve uh, multiple days. And if that's the case, as long as you document the reason for the added length of the diagnostic interview, you can bill two units on two separate separate dates. You can't bill multiple units on the same day, unfortunately, but you certainly could bill multiple units over a span of um, a couple, uh, several different days. So that's the diagnostic interview. Uh, interactive complexity would, is an add-on code. It's something that, that you can receive a little more reimbursement uh, for the service if there are communication issues that are complicating the performance of the service. So either the diagnostic interview or ther therapy. Um, it might be that um, the, pac the patient has, um, that there, there might be uh, emotional issues or uh, patients with, uh, that are verbally undeveloped or impaired um, or other situations that um, make it more difficult for you to do your work. Um, this code is available to add a little more reimbursement to your, to get, uh, uh, you know, compensated for that extra time. You can use it for your diagnostic interview and in addition to your therapy codes as well. Um, all of your uh, therapy codes as well. And the service is basically used, uh, certainly to use, uh, to evaluate children that haven't acquired, uh, they're not fully capable in terms of their communication skills yet. So uh, any uh, service using, making use of objects, toys, and uh, the like. Um, adults who do not have the ability to interact through normal, uh, ordinary verbal communication, uh, where physical aids are used, uh, or an interpreter is used, either for the deaf or someone that uh, doesn't speak uh, the same language as, as you, um, that would be acceptable as well. Um, and certainly also patients that have uh, organic or other mental deficits that um, make communication more difficult. 
So you may report this service when there's uh, any type of maladaptive, maladaptive communication issue. Um, as we said, emotional or behavioral conditions, um, abuse or neglect, or whether uh, play instruments or other devices or an interpreter or translator is used in connection with the service. Uh, your medical record would have to justify the reason for your use of this code. And it includes what is the specific adaptation that was utilized, what is your rationale uh, for employing the, this technique, and also the uh, treatment recommendations going forward. So sometime after the completion of the diagnostic interview and before therapy starts, there is a requirement that every patient have a, a, a treatment plan. There is an expectation, by the way, that before treatment is initiated, that a diagnostic interview is, is, is performed, all right, normally, except in unusual circumstances like uh, a crisis type of psychotherapy service. Sometimes the patient is, where there's an, an immediate need for a therapeutic intervention, has to be taken care of first before the diagnostic interview, that's okay, but normally, the diagnostic interview comes first, the treatment plan is developed, and then therapy is initiated. Uh, the treatment plan, um, and we did find some issues, some missing data uh, in the treatment plans on review, uh, but the treatment plan for each problem, specific major issue that's addressed, should include the modality, uh, the amount, what is the expected length of each session, the frequency, how often are the sessions expected to be delivered, and duration, especially from a medical necessity standpoint, uh, that's particularly important is how long do you expect the treatment to last? And I know this is not always easy, but the good news is you can adjust that if you get to the end to the end of that period. Let's say you say it's six months. If you get to the end of that period and your goal hasn't been met, you can extend that that period at that time with an amendment to your treatment plan. But to not have a, uh, a dura expected duration of treatment um, is kind of a red flag um, because psychotherapy, like all other forms of medical treatment, third party payers are concerned about, obviously the cost gets larger the longer treatment is um, extended. So um, that is likely to be a focus of any review. Uh, the diagnosis, the specific diagnosis or diagnoses, and the goals uh, for each problem. Uh, it, it, it can be a multidisciplinary document as well. So some definitions. Um, reasonable expectation of improvement is an important uh, definition for medical necessity. And, and, and by the way, medical necessity is the... Uh, uh, to, Medicare's mantra is medical necessity is the overarching criterion for payment. Um, it's what underlies the, the reimbursement uh, for all uh, services, medical and psychiatric. Um, and so what is meant in psychiatry, what is meant by uh, improvement? Um, in this context, um, it's, it's measured by comparing the effect of continuing treatment versus discontinuing, discontinuing it. For example, if there is reason to believe that discontinuing treat, treatment would constitute or result in a deterioration, relapse, or hospitalization, then you have certainly met the uh, reasonable expectation for improvement. So improvement is kind of a relative term. We're not saying necessarily that the patient has to improve, although in many cases that does happen, but at least, at the very least, the, the, the bar is that the patient is not going to deteriorate uh, if treatment is, is removed. So when you reach the point where stability can be maintained without further treatment or less in, intensive treatment, um, then psychological services are not considered no longer medically necessary. Um, the frequency and duration of services, what's appropriate from a medical necessity standpoint? Well, there's no specific limits on the length of time that services may be covered, but again, you would have to associate 
the length of service or the duration with the patient's condition and the goals. So that someone, a peer for example, would look at your treatment plan and say, yeah, that's reasonable for that condition, that length of time, that intensity of service, that's a reasonable um, uh, plan. Um, again, as long as the evidence shows that the patient, uh, the patient continues to show improvement in, uh, in accordance with the plan and the frequency of services is within accepted norms, uh, coverage may continue. Um, and if, uh, it, it, if the patient has reached the point where further improvement, according to the definition, does not appear to be indicated, uh, then the services would not be considered medically necessary. But if, you've, again, you've reached the end of that expected duration and the patient has not fully met their goals or they're still in a situation where uh, uh, improvement, further improvement can be expected, then you can adjust the, the plan. Okay, um, any questions about either the diagnostic interview or the treatment plan at this point? Okay, so getting into the services themselves, psychotherapy, um, we have the definition there, I won't, I won't read it, uh, uh, but from a documentation standpoint, um, the thing that we did occasionally find problems, uh, problem areas were with the two fundamental elements that must be documented uh, to support psychotherapy. One is the amount of face-to-face -face time that you spend with the patient. And face-to-face -face time is exactly that. It's not the scheduled time. If the patient comes 15 minutes late um, or gets up in the middle of the session and leaves for some reason, then you can only bill for the actual time that you spend with the patient. Um, and the, the amount should never be expressed in terms of a range say I you know 30 minute 30 to 45 minutes it should always be either there are two ways to do it either the amount of time specifically 30 minutes 35 minutes 40 minutes or a range of times if you prefer like start and stop times uh, excuse me I don't mean to be confusing not a range start and stop times are are specific range is 30 to 45 but start and stop times are specific three o'clock to 345. Uh, the other piece, the other essential element to the psychotherapy service is what was the specific therapeutic maneuver that was employed during the session, right? One of the most common problems we find on audit is we find a very lengthy uh, portion of the note is concerned with the patient, their history, uh, what the patient uh, says that they've been doing, uh, and how they're feeling, etc., their circumstances. Uh, and then we get to the end of the note and there's an assessment, but we have no idea what was, what was the therapist's contribution to this, uh, to this service. And that's really what the missing piece, that's the piece that really we need to see in order to support that a psychotherapy service actually took place. Right? Now I know this is, can be somewhat hard to describe, um, but the, the, the threshold isn't very high. As long as you describe your service in some way, whether it be you know, insight-oriented uh, psychotherapy or supportive psychotherapy or cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy was employed, or you can speak about it in very general terms, or, I don't know if you've seen it, but we passed around a, a sheet with a list of about 30 different phrases that you can use to indicate active the, the therapist's active contribution to the session, um, that's been um, made available to the clinic. So those are the kind of things that um, you need to document in your note to, to support on audit that the, the session's taking place. Yes? Oh, we didn't get that list. Yeah, so um, uh, um, Bob, can, can we get that up to the uh, to providers if, if, if it's tricky? If you don't have it, I can send it to you again. Okay. Uh, it's a one pager with mm -hmm. about 30 different, um, you know, just examples of the kind of language that you can use okay. that, that, that meets this, this requirement. Mm -hmm. We'll definitely get it out to you. Um, so, additionally, other information that can, um, that can and should be uh, in your note is a is a summary of the goals, the progress towards goals, uh, an updated treatment plan. So 
when, it, when, it, when we talk about progress, um, as you know, of course, patients' progress in psychotherapy, you know, it's, it may be hard to measure that from visit to visit. But it is appropriate for, you know, after, even before the treatment plan is updated, um, for you to kind of assess, okay, so there's been eight sessions now, where has the patient come in these eight sessions? And just kind of make a note of your observations and your, your, uh, uh, your assessment. Um, and so periodically, um, adding up the, the, all of the incremental changes that they've made, kind of, you know, uh, summarizing it in your note, that would be appropriate as well. Um, and certainly prolonged periods of psych psychotherapy should be uh, well supported in the medical record. Um, and, and, and what we mean is prolonged periods that either, a, as I mentioned earlier, a prolong, uh, prolonging of the duration uh, or, except, or extremely long sessions, individual sessions that are outside of the, the plan. If you document the reason for a particularly long session, um, then you won't have any problem. Um, from a reporting standpoint, um, the, uh, it's a time-based service, and the way uh, time-based services are reported in CPT, the rules for that, is that if more than half of the time allotted for each service has been documented, then you can bill for the service. So what that means is when you break it all down, what that means is those are the, these are the time periods for each one of the codes, and the codes for you would be 90832, 90834, and 90837. 16 to 37 minutes for 90832, 38 to 52 for 90834, and 53 or more for 90837. Right? I don't know exactly how these codes appear on your encounter form or your billing mechanism. Um, they sometimes different places have different mnemonics for, for, the, for the codes, but, um, but those are the sessions, those are the three sessions. 16 to 37 minutes, 38 to 52, and 53 or more, which, again, explains why the requirement for documenting your time is, is so important. Um, okay, so um, I think that's all on this slide. I'm going to the next slide. Family, th uh, any questions about individual psychotherapy? So family psychotherapy, we have uh, three codes here. I have uh, uh, family psychotherapy when the patient is not present, uh, family psychotherapy when the patient is present. And what that means, by the way, is that the patient has to be present for at least a part of the family uh, therapy session. So you may have some sessions where it's patient with family, and then the patient leaves, and then it's family alone, which happens. That's okay. That's considered, that's not patient not present, that's patient present. It's not a time-based service. It's typically 45 minutes or more, but it's not a time-based service. Um, and then we have uh, group therapy, uh, uh, multi-family group therapy is a, is a family, is a, uh, uh, it's a, uh, it's actually a, uh, uh, well, it's a group family, kind of a hybrid uh, form um, to, uh, um, when uh, the families have similar dynamics and there's a common theme and the issues are, uh, uh, the issues, uh, the common issues are confronted uh, for the families under treatment. So family therapy, um, so only covered when the primary uh, purpose of such psychotherapy is treatment of the patient's condition, okay? So that's the first requirement for family therapy is you have to identify a patient, okay? So family therapy isn't family therapy unless there is a, uh, a, a, a target uh, patient, right? Um, so uh, for example, um, uh, years ago we had, um, uh, we used to hear the phrase couples therapy, okay? Well, couples therapy can be family therapy, but one of the, one of the couple has to, be the, has to be the patient for, for you know, for reporting and and, and, and billing purposes. The couple is not a patient. We have to identify who the patient is. Um, but the other member, the point is with family therapy, the other members of the family are brought into the therapeutic process. And it has to be described how, exactly how 
the other members of the family are brought into the therapeutic process and why uh, the family therapy is, is needed. Um, it does not obviously have to be a traditional family, all right? Um, any, uh, any members of the, um, the home situation, the living situation, whether they be living companions, caretakers, or significant others uh, that are involved in the, uh, you know, the, the home living arrangement is, is qualifies. Um, Okay, so, and again, the other, uh, again, the, uh, you're, what you're focusing on is describing your, the particular therapeutic te techniques or maneuvers that are being used uh, in, in general fashion. Uh, for group therapy, um, no more than 12 participants and at least two uh, participants for, for group therapy, uh, probably more than that, but... Um, the, the, again, the therapy lasts usually 45 to 60 minutes, but is not a time-based service, so you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, and um, so the uh, so the uh, group therapy session usually there is a, uh, a again a common theme or a topic to the group therapy that would certainly have to be made clear uh, in the note. Um, and um, obviously, each individual would have to have their own note. You have to be particularly sensitive to, uh, to uh, HIPAA concerns when you're documenting individual notes and notes in a group therapy setting, because if you had information, personal information about another patient in another in another patient's note, and that patient were to somehow get a hold of that note, you, you need to be concerned about that. Um, so you have to be uh, careful in the, in the, in the language. Um, and uh, so that the, the important point, though, is that from a documentation standpoint, is once you've identified the common theme or the, uh, the goal of the, the group, that each individual note has to have a, uh, an individualized portion of the note stating the individual's contribution and response to the treatment for that, to the session for that day. And so there should be uh, basically two sections to the group therapy note, one that is common to each member of the group, uh, to all members of the group, and one that is particular to each patient describing the individual status, participation, and progress. Okay, so um, that basically concludes the uh, information I have for you today, but I do want to take a few minutes in case anybody has any questions, anything that I have not uh, covered, uh, uh, that, uh, miscellaneous questions you might have. Uh, were there also um, handouts or a way to get copies of the slides? Oh. Also, if there are any uh, follow-up follow questions uh, after the presentation, a lot of times these questions come up uh, after you, you're back in the clinic um, and uh, you think of something, um, you know, please forward your questions to Bob. I, I think you're going to take those questions and they can, uh, they can be forwarded to me and I'll, I'll be happy to respond to uh, those questions as well. Yes. So I was curious to know how we're going to do the uh, the trainees um, documentation. Oh, um, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, so let me go back to I, I might have uh, glossed over that slide a little too quickly uh, because that's an important issue. Um, uh, so um, trainees uh, and, and students, trainees, interns uh, cannot. Um, their services are not recognized for payment. Um, and so in order to bill for a, a for any service, um, the so the from an auditing standpoint, a service, the documenter is the performer of that service. 
and the performer of the service, some performers of the service are qualified for payment and others aren't. So that, is, makes, uh, that makes it a challenge because if you are working with an intern and you have an intern write the note, which admittedly they need to do in order to learn, okay, then, but you can't just turn around and co-sign their note and bill for it. Because from an audit standpoint, it's the student that performed that service and not you, and they're not qualified for payment. So what I suggest, and this is always a difficult subject, um, the medical docs with residents, they basically have a mechanism, an approved mechanism, to utilize the residents' documentation. That mechanism does not exist for therapy. So in order for you to bill for therapy, what I would recommend, so you have two choices, either not bill for a service provided by, a, a documented by a student or, a, or an intern, or uh, write a separate note on your own with just the, the absolutely essential elements that will be needed to support the bill. So for example, let's say you were conducting a group therapy session with uh, an intern. And so they would be able to write the group, the group portion of the note, right? But you would have to document the individual portion with, with, which has the assessment. They could, they could write a note too, but in addition to that, you would have to assess the patient's progress, their participation, etc. All right? In a summary format, it doesn't have to be very detailed. There are no specific, um, there's not a long list of detail, but you would have to at least show by your own documentation, not by their documentation, that you were present and that you were making observation of the patient. The same thing with psychotherapy, right? The student might write a very long, detailed list about the patient's history, all right? And you could add to that with an addendum, you could add to that that you were personally present for 45 minutes and that these were the uh, psychotherapeutic interventions that were utilized and then one more sentence summarizing the whole thing. So this is my recommendation to therapists who are working with students, right, whereby they don't have to repeat everything that was documented by the student especially the history part, is well recognized as a part of the note that a student can, can document. But the essential elements that are required to build a service, if you choose to build it, has to be documented by you, either by a separate note or with an addendum. Yeah. Because in our case, our students meet along with the patient, we're not present. So um, it sounds like the easiest thing would be to have them just do laundry loads, right? That, no, that, no, 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 no. No, there's no such thing. Uh, they're using the same form that you are, and they have a tab in order to uh, to document other things. It's just that it's filtered out from Bill. Okay. And also the, the same. They use the same form. They but it's just filtered form. out out of it. Okay. Yeah. But we, we still have to sign it. Out. There's no counter signature requirement anymore. The uh, the trainee has a tab in which they say who the supervising. Uh, person is and who the prescribing psychiatrist is for that particular client. So they fill out the whole form themselves and for individual. For group, on the other hand, if you co-lead with somebody who can't, uh, then there is a, uh, a tab in which your addendum is formatted and you can just do that. And that's where that would be the appropriate place for, for you to put your the information that would support the billing. And by the way, um, while I think of it, um, one of the other results uh, of this review is that um, Bob and his team has updated the templates that you use in, in the uh, uh, the uh, MI, MI, MHIS. MHIS system uh, that uh, will help you to meet all of these uh, requirements. Um, there, they've been some very good additions and um, um, modifications to those uh, templates with instructions, uh, user instructions, which are which are very good. So, um, um, so yeah. So that that I'm glad you brought that up too. Thank you for bringing that up. A very that's a very important uh, and, and often controversial 
uh, topic. And, and that's really the goal of all this is that perfection is, is a little bit, is, it's not possible. But what we want to do is we want to see progress. We want to, from review to review, we want to see that the practice as a whole is, you know, improving and getting closer to, uh, um, you know, closer to 100% uh, uh, accuracy, even though it's a, it's a very, like I said earlier, it's not, it's not really possible. It's, it's it, it, too many, it's just not a, a realistic goal, but uh, we are, we are, we, we do want to improve. Um, any other questions? Those were all really good questions. Uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you all thank very you. much for coming. Thank you.